There we go. Benny. Very good. Well, it's nice to have you. Um, uh, thank you all our, um, our viewers on Zoom and on YouTube for, uh, for waiting. I'm sure it was well worth the wait. I'm delighted to welcome the Minister of Defense of the State of Israel, Benny Gantz, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, um, uh, former Chief of Staff, Chief of the General Staff of the Israel Defense Forces. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Benny. I'm, uh, I'm really delighted that you could take time. I know these are uh, busy days. Um, with great challenges at home and abroad. And I thank you very much for joining us. Um, uh, you are online with uh, the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, um, with people who are joining on multiple platforms. Um, and I look forward to a, a fascinating conversation with you. But I want to uh, first um, uh, give you the floor um, uh, for some opening remarks at this uh, very important time for you and the state of Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. Benny Gantz. Hello again. Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, always great to meet with you and with you all. Uh, and before saying anything, I just want to wish a happy Passover to everybody and happy Easter to those who celebrate Easter and happy Ramadan or Ramadan Karim to those who celebrate Ramadan. Uh, we are in holiday season uh, which is very important uh, for us all. And I hope it's going to be a quiet uh, season as much as possible. Uh, the beginning is not something to be proud of, but uh, it's still reality as it is. Uh, from my perspective, uh, uh, I would like to mention that Israel actually uh, need to deal with five strategic challenges, two of which are domestic, uh, the, the fabric of the Israeli society and Israel's uh, infrastructure, meaning the periphery up north and down south. Uh, with your permission, I will not uh, reflect the, the internal challenges that we have, but I will focus on three uh, external ones or regional ones that I think we need to deal with. And it's about Israel and the global arena. Uh, the Iranian challenge and uh, the relations we have with our Palestinian neighbors. As far as uh, uh, Israel and the global uh, arena, uh, I think that uh, we must, we should say that Israel uh, global standing and uh, its international relations bring both challenges and opportunities. First, I would say United States and Israel relation. Uh, as said so many times before, uh, we do share a unique bond. Uh, and really, uh, the amount of visits from the United States to Israel and Israel to the United States uh, and the support we get uh, from the United States is, sec is actually second to none. And uh, we are very grateful for the security assistance that we've been getting. And we are very grateful for the uh, pass of the last resolutions and, and other activities, uh, of course. Um, uh, and I think uh, we must find ways to constantly strengthen our relation uh, with uh, the international community uh, under the leadership of the United uh, of the United States, uh, and we must increase and strengthen our relations uh, with our regional neighbors, uh, which is definitely uh, a very good trend. Actually, what we are seeing uh, currently. Uh, is uh, a simultaneous trend of positive trend of normalization from one directive uh, based mainly on the peace agreement we had with Egypt and Jordan added to them the agreement we had with Bahrain, UAE in Morocco and, and I must say the very good relations we have with other countries even if we don't have uh, official uh, treaties with them. 
And the other trend is, I would say, versus criminalization, as Micha Goodman have described it, uh, the effort of the Palestinians to delegitimize Israel, whether it's with BDS or apartheid countries, so or the pressure we do get from the uh, international community over the Palestinian uh, over the Palestinian uh, issue, and I think uh, we must find ways uh, to minimize the international pressure. Of course, from my perspective and political perspective, uh, I think uh, that uh, we must find ways to live with the Palestinians uh, in what I would call uh, two entity situation. Uh, uh, versus old phrase of two-state solution. Uh, we can elaborate on this later on, if you wish. Uh, still in the uh, international arena, I would say a few words about Ukraine. Uh, obviously, Israel stands with the West. Uh, we seek uh, a quick end to the war. Uh, we are totally committed to humanitarian aid. And uh, we maintain mediation efforts and communication with both Ukraine and Russia. Uh, this is, uh, of course, very important. Uh, of course, uh, there is the Iranian issue. That's the second issue. Uh, I've said it before. Uh, this is uh, a constant insight, I would say. But I believe Iran is a global and regional challenge and also a threat for the state of Israel. Uh, I hate to see it as a solely Israeli problem because then go ahead and fix it. Uh, no, I don't think that's the case. I think Iran is involved in the global arena. Iran is involved in the regional arena. And we must look at it as such. Uh, Iran continued to enrich uh, uranium, as we all know, and uh, they are very uh, close uh, to the 90% capabilities. Uh, I would say a few weeks uh, uh, away from it. Everybody's pressing for pressing for uh, agreement with them on this uh, issue, and mainly saying that we better push them back uh, a little bit from where they are right now. Uh, we all understand uh, that uh, uh, post agreement time will be totally different. Uh, situation as far as Iran in the area. Uh, it will give them lots of funds. Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, that we may see a negative impact on the regional activities, given the fact that we will have so much funds. So I must say that I don't like to see a poor agreement trying to solve a big problem. Uh, and if there is an agreement, it has to be solid and must fill all the loopholes, such as sunset, warheads, uh, uh, etc. I won't repeat all the, all the list, it's well known uh, in advance. Uh, there might be an op a situation in which uh, there won't be an agreement. I think that in that case, there's no vacuum. And uh, I think then uh, we should see a plan B activated by the international community that can be united, as we saw in the Ukrainian issue. Uh, and uh, if uh, uh, we need, we can move forward with economic pressure, intelligence cooperation, diplomatic pressure, power projection, you know, counter, uh, counter uh, regional terror counter terrorism activities, etc. Um, from our perspective, of course, Iran is also an, uh, an operational uh, threat, and we must be prepared uh, to deal with Iran as a whole package, if you wish, on the nuclear issue, on the, on the state aspect, in terms, assuming that they will act against us. And uh, uh, of course, uh, the nuclear uh, aspect as well. Uh, I think we must continue to work against the IOGC and Quds forces. They are the biggest 
exporter of terror in the world. And I think it should be treated as uh, such. And we must uh, deepen and expand uh, our regional cooperation uh, in the region. Uh, so I've talked about the importance of staying connected to the international community and its challenges. I spoke about the importance of facing Iran as it is and not as we hope it to, hope it to be. And uh, with your permission, I will say two sentences about the Palestinian arena and we can go to questions from there. Uh, basically, uh, I think uh, as far as Gaza, we have changed our policy since operation uh, of the guardian of the walls it's almost a year back uh, we are very conservative as far as military activities uh, but we are very open with uh, with humanitarian and economical activities uh, you know there are some 20 12 uh, 12 thousands uh, of workers coming from Gaza it injected lots of economical uh, release into Gaza and uh, currently it's uh, a huge challenge operationally speaking but it's uh, very quiet right now it can change on an hourly basis so don't be surprised if something happens today or tomorrow or whenever it is it can always change and we are in very sensitive time. As far as the Palestinian Authority, the arrest in, in Judea and Samaria, uh, I would say that I think we should continue strengthening our ties with the Palestinian Authority at all levels, from the state level to the operational level. This is very important. Uh, we must continue our security coordination with the Palestinian Authority. We should continue with uh, confidence building measures with the Palestinian Authority to increase work permits, uh, building approval, uh, industrial zones, uh, development, uh, everything in our capacity to make sure that uh, we have good relations with them. Uh, uh, my policy is to ensure our security while investing in the future. Uh, of course, the Palestinian, but mainly from my perspective, is making sure that Israel gets to stay Jewish and democratic state. And I'm saying it by what I would say, as I said before, two entity concept. Uh, when people say two state solution, it's you know it creates a huge gap between an old phrase on one hand and a very far away vision on the other hand. And this is very complicated as a reference time. So what I'm trying to build in the middle is a better reference for the Palestinian and us. Uh, first, to make sure that we have security, secondly, to develop economy, and then down the road to increase the uh, Palestinian governance as much as possible, because uh, I want to deal with Israeli civilians and not with, uh, with the Palestinians. I want them to do it. And for me, this is very important. Last but not least is our recent terror attack that we have been seeing. Uh, we had we went through several uh, attacks in the last two weeks. Unfortunately, uh, 14 people killed and dozens of attacks have been prevented. Uh, basically, our forces are employing a triangle of intelligence activities, offensive connected to the intelligence activities to try to be as accurate as we can and precise as we can and intercept those who need to be intercepted and let the others leave as much as possible. Uh, defensive measures. Uh, um, um, and uh, we try to separate as much as possible between the terrorists that we are fighting against and, of course, uh, uh, the population as much as possible. Uh, this is uh, a challenging and sensitive time. You know, Ramadan should be a time of worship, uh, spending time with families, etc. And I believe, really believe, uh, uh, that most Palestinian and Israeli Muslim citizens want to celebrate the holiday just as such. You know, last Saturday I've spent the uh, the dinner. We start dinner with Muslims friends in the city of Taibi in Israel. 
they are totally against uh, terror activities and they want to live their life. I think that's uh, 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 this is as much as uh, as much as I can say. We must make sure that the mental uh, mount is open for worship. And the last uh, Friday, close to fifty thousand people were there, and I'm sure that that will be the hopefully. And that will be the future uh, as well. Um, it is very important that the Palestinian Authority officials have condemned the attacks. Having said that, some of the officials uh, are inciting to terror, mainly in the area of Jenin, uh, and this hurts both Palestinians and Israelis, and I hope and to see uh, concrete action by the uh, by the Palestinian Authority. We obviously won't be waiting for them, but we will try to maintain communication with them as much as uh, much as possible. And I look at this wave of terror. Uh, it, there is there is the risk of escalation into a wider campaign in Gaza or some events in Lebanon, or I don't know what would be, you know, we go from one day to another, and it's very hard to see what would be the future. Uh, but I'm sure that uh, uh, we will beat this terror wave uh, with our powerful security forces uh, by the resilience of our nation and people, and by the balance between determination, operational determination, and responsible policy as much as I can. So much for the opening remarks, and I can, Rob, take any kind of question you can think of. It. Terrific. Thank you very much, Benny. That was a very useful look at a, a broad range of topics. Um, lots of issues to discuss, and so I think it's important if we begin where you left off with the with the wave of terrorism that Israelis are facing. Um, uh, I wanna ask you about your analysis of where this is coming from. There have been, some of these are uh, claimed by uh, the Islamic State, pra some praised by Hamas, uh, Janine, radical elements of Fatah. Is there organization to this? Are there, are these lone wolves? What is, what is your assessment of, of what is behind the wave of terror. Yeah, uh, as I said uh, before, uh, most of the people uh, in Israel, in Judea and Samaria, and I would risk to say in Gaza as well, want to spend the Ramadan as such. Uh, most of them are against it, uh, etc. When you look at the organization, perspective, I would differ between uh, ISIS or Islamic State, which is, by the way, a combination of an idea and organization. You know, it's, it's sometimes you can think of it as more like an idea than a pure organization, even though it has some kind of organizational structure. And uh, those uh, three people that were involved, you know, the uh, they, they identify themselves with the organization. It's not that the organization has sent them, etc. Uh, I guess we have several of them. We are trying to uh, intelligently uh, pin, pin them and activate directly against them. Um, even if you know, take uh, the town of Umil Fachem, where those two people came from. And you hear the head of the municipality talks against them. He talks against them as harsh as I'm talking against them, which is very important from my perspective. And I encourage this kind of uh, activities. And uh, when I look at Hamas and Jihad Islamic Palestinian group, I think that I can uh, talk about the phrase NIMBY, uh, not in my backyard. They are very encouraged. They are encouraging terrorist activities, but not in their region because they want to stay. They want to keep it quiet as much as possible. Uh, everybody must remember that those kind of things not, are not uh, always get to stay under control. An escalation uh, can happen and feed itself. This is why it is very uh, dangerous. Uh, 
And of course, there is the aspect of inspiration. If you go through a quiet day, it may feed a quiet day to follow. If you go through a day with events, it may feed another day of events uh, to follow. So there's not much I can say. I hope we can keep it quiet uh, and to take it uh, by day by day. Uh, there's not a day goes by without me uh, assessing the situation. Uh, once again, trying to make sure that the vast majority of the population gets to stay out of it. And I hope I can keep it this way. So a year ago, Jerusalem was the focus of tension and, and conflict erupted. Um, this year, it's been quiet. I know you've so far, at least, and hopefully will remain so. Now, I know that you've been investing quite a bit. What, what has changed between last year and this year um, that, uh, that things so far, at least, have remained quiet in Jerusalem? Uh, I think that several issues uh, were put away, uh, uh, such as the issue of Sheikh Jarrah that was closed by the court and it's not an issue anymore. Uh, we have changed some of our tactics to try to mitigate some kind of uh, field conflicts, I would say, between uh, places. Uh, the gate of Nablus, you know, uh, instead of just having troops there, uh, and uh, we have opened uh, different uh, small shops and things like that, that people can actually come and, and, and enjoy the place. Give, having said that, we still had two events uh, in the last uh, few days that were starting to uh, be problematic. We tried to make sure that the people that uh, wants to come to pray uh, the temple uh, can do so. Uh, we have enabled uh, people from above 50 to come without uh, permits. And if the situation continues to be good, I will expand it as well for people with 45 years of age, uh, I'm seeking for good, but I'm ready for the bad. And I hope um, we can continue to do good. Now, um, I wanna ask about how your government, how this current coalition responds to terrorism and how it compares to previous uh, governments. In previous, in the past, Israel often, um, in addition to security measures, would often respond to terrorism by approving this or that settlement uh, program that is in the pipeline. Um, uh, uh, now, you outlined a, uh, a series of sort of confidence building measures that, you, that you've been investing in with, um, with the Palestinians and the Palestinian authorities. Um, do you also expect the current government to, to go down the, the, the other path of uh, of uh, um, approving different settlement activity in the wake of this uh, wave of terror? Uh, I'm sitting in my office for nearly two years now, uh, and I've approved uh, thousands of uh, houses for both Israelis and Palestinians. It's not just I'm adding it to one side, I'm allowing uh, both sides uh, to be able to live their life normally, uh, to develop uh, Israeli settlements, mainly within the Balkhs, but elsewhere as well. But also, I've approved several Palestinians uh, planning, building plannings in, in area C, etc. Uh, uh, I believe that, uh, by and large, uh, not just, uh, you know, we, we need to move from fighting against uh, from, or, or from the struggle who will not be living here, to how we both going to live here. Uh, and, and it's a totally different, uh, uh, totally different approach. Uh, we, we continue uh, to build for both Israelis and Palestinians in a lawful manner, in the right time, uh, I believe, in, in the close future, but it's in the right time. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's going to happen, uh, as I said, uh, under a careful assessment of the situation, but it won't be stopped. 
and we will move forward uh, with uh, with confidence building measure and with with economical activities as much as uh, we can. You know, uh, I'll give you Rob an example, something we didn't do before and we are doing now. You can have factories, let's say in Nablus, that we have gave them the permission to produce product under Israeli criteria. And they are doing it in Nablus and they are marketing directly to Israel with no inspection in the, in, in the middle. So things are moving forward. And the more the economical situation it is, the better off we are with stability. And once it's stable and a good economy, the security level goes uh, up. And we are telling to our Palestinian neighbors, when it is quiet, you will enjoy the economical flourishing. That's the case in Gaza. They have 12,500 people coming to work in Israel. If it stays quiet, I will increase it. If it goes wrong, I'll have to seize it. I hope that uh, they will understand it. And if God forbid, they won't. Uh, there's always the negative way. You know, we can always go back. It's, it's easy for us. Um, just connected to this, uh, just in the last 24 hours, uh, I know you 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 referred to the um, uh, to the mayor of Umul Fakhem being very tough against uh, the terrorists that came from his town. Um, uh, we also saw a leading Arab Israeli politician, Ayman Oda, um, uh, urge. Um, uh, Israeli Arabs who serve in the security forces of the police to to leave their jobs. Um, uh, um, what, what's your reaction to this? I think that's an irresponsible declaration. Uh, I know that Ayman Oda have condemned the terror, the terror activities several days ago. Uh, and uh, and I think he's totally wrong and he shouldn't declare those kind of things. He's an Arab leader, should be trying to uh, cool off the pressure and the heat rather than uh, saying uh, uh, negative declaration as such, uh, of course. Uh, and, uh, you know, <laughs> Let us not forget a policeman by the name of Amir Khouri, who accidentally I used to know personally, was killed in Lebra some 10 days ago, riding a motorcycle, intercepting these terrorists. He is an Arab Christian, an Israeli Arab Christian. We are human beings. The victims can be Israelis, whether they are Jews or they are Muslims. And, and the security forces are operating to secure everybody. Uh, and I think uh, Ayman Oda should have not said this, uh, whatever he said. Um, Benny, we, um, we, we, we touched on a, 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 um, uh, the intersection of security and politics. So before I go on to Ukraine and Iran, I have to ask you, um, when given the political events of the last several days, um, how do you evaluate the stability and longevity of the coalition in which you serve? Uh, you know, it's very hard to tell, but uh, <laughs> I, I can tell you this. Uh, while it is, uh, you can never be sure who would be the governing party or coalition, I can assure you that Israel gets to state democracy. Uh, and this is something which is very much there. So, okay, I understand the political game and people are seeking uh, to ensure them their political future. Uh, uh, and uh, it's uh, it seemed very complicated. Uh, uh, because now in the parliament we are 60 60. Uh, it will be very uh, challenging to operate like this. Uh, I think our government is a very complex government, but it pretty much represents 
the complexity of the Israeli society, because we have right wing and left wing, we have Jews and Arabs, we have religious and secular. Uh, unfortunately, we are only missing the ultra orthodox within the government. I think we are doing good job uh, for the state of Israel in so many different aspects. Uh, uh, while maintaining security uh, and dealing with the international environment as, as we do, we are still moving forward in, uh, in advancing the Israeli society. We are dealing very well with the corona issue. Uh, we are absorbing uh, what we call the Aliyah waves or immigrants uh, by thousands of people that are coming from Ukraine, Russia and Belarus mainly. Uh, those are the three main countries that people are coming from. Uh, and we succeed uh, to uh, reunite the growth, economical growth in Israel. So I hope that we can keep the government. But uh, uh, you know, Rob, you have seen politics uh, more than I have. Uh, I've done so only three years now, uh, and it's very hard to see uh, where we're going to be next week. I know where we want to be next. Week. We want to be with a functioning government, responsible government that serves the entire society of Israel. Okay, fair enough. Um, all right, Benny, let, let's move on to uh, a couple of questions on, uh, on Iran and the prospect of an Iran nuclear deal. Um, I have to say that there's some multiple voices that have come out, at least uh, openly and and uh, reportedly from, from your government. On the one hand, um, some representatives of, of your coalition describe the prospective deal as even worse than the original deal, um, uh, that it's um, uh, even worse than the 2015 JCPOA from Israel's perspective. Other officials, and this was reported in the press, have, uh, have said that Perhaps it, even a bad deal is better than no deal because it gives Israel a, um, an opportunity to have time to prepare additional options. So which is it? Or can both be true? Uh, yes, Rob, uh, you may remember that actually the first speech I gave after I retired from the IDF was in Washington Institute back in the end of 19, uh, 2015. Yes. And, and when I refer to the nuclear deal, uh, uh, I said something like, it's not a question of a good deal or a bad deal, it's a question of a done deal. Let's see what we can do with it as such. Uh, I think uh, that under the current circumstances, I think we should seek if we seek a deal, it should be a solid one. Uh, and to try to minimize the loopholes that we are seeing uh, within the deal itself. And let us not forget uh, that we have always already lost or enjoyed, it depends who you are asking, seven years uh, from 2015 to 2022. So the end of it is a bit closer than it was when we when we talked about uh, the year of 2015. So uh, it depends of, honestly speaking, it depends of how you look at it. Uh, I understand the American wish to put the Iranian issue back in the box. But if you don't close the open loopholes, you're gonna get serious problem down the road. So I understand why, what are the benefits of a potential deal, as long as it's taking care of what needs to be taken care of. Uh, so I don't know if there'll be a deal or not. Uh, if there'll be a deal, we will have to take the time permit uh, to continue and ensuring our uh, operational capabilities, etc. If uh, there won't be a deal, we'll have to move to plan B, as I said before. Uh, 
Uh, and when I'm saying we, I refer to the international community, to the regional community, and to Israel as well. Uh, Can you say a bit more about how, if there is a plan, you would use the time available and what role you'd like the United States to play um, in taking this time and making maximum use of it to prepare for whatever needs to be prepared for? Yeah, uh, on this issue, I would have to limit myself, uh, uh, obviously, because we are talking about very sensitive issues. And I, if I'll tell you exactly what I intend to do, then I'll have to shoot you later. And this is something I don't want to do, obviously. But seriously, That's very kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously speaking, uh, Altogether, if I have to come up uh, with several uh, areas of activities, I would say that we must make sure we are increasing our intelligence cooperation and create something like an intelligence coalition, if you wish, a very broad one, that operate against Iran and compensate for the lack of inspection capabilities. Because if we were to have a good agreement, it could be inspection anytime, anywhere, but this is not the case in the agreement. So we will have to fill the gap of intelligence. We will have to increase offensive capabilities and but and, and force demonstration and cooperation and training together and making sure that we are capable to work together. Uh, or obviously, I would say something about Israel later on, but uh, offensive capacity. We will have to intercept uh, uh, regional activities made by Iran in different places and the countries are well known, Yemen, Syria, Iraq, obviously Lebanon and Gaza Strip. Uh, but there are other places, you know, there are uh, Iranian activities in, in, in uh, Algeria, there is Iranian connection to West Sahara, you have in Iranian activities in South America. So it's, it's something that we have to deal with it. We'll have to increase uh, our defensive capacity uh in different places and as i've said before we will have to communicate with the iranian society which i believe is a good society get held hostage by a very uh, negative regime uh, but that's a long run uh, activity uh, from an israeli perspective uh, talking about uh, ukraine the lesson learned from ukraine uh, you can think of uh, two aspects mainly. Uh, one, we see how careful the Western world behaves with Russia. It uses lots of economic pressure, political pressure, etc. It's very careful with military option. And I guess it has to do with the fact that Russia is a nuclear superpower. And all the calculus become somewhat different when you have such, an, such a challenge. This is something we should not allow Iran to develop. That's, a, that's an international uh, insight, if you ask me. That's a regional insight, if you ask me. And it is definitely an Israeli insight, if you ask me. Uh, and the second lesson learned from Ukraine is, uh, and, and we know it for years, uh, Eventually, you need to solve your own problems. Nobody comes to help. Uh, and, and Israel have never asked no one to fight for it. And, uh, and we must make our own measures uh, on the entire issue that I spoke of. Uh, I think the last one we can we can hardly influence the the we can hardly influence the the Iranian society or the Iranian economy because we are a small country. But we are capable, and we should stay capable of dealing with the security and military aspects of it. You, you just raised Ukraine. Let me ask you two questions about Ukraine, Benny. 
Um, first, have you seen any change in Russian uh, deployment or operations in your next door neighbor, Syria? And have does does the Russian focus on Ukraine open up any opportunities in Syria? Is there a change in the strategic uh, situation there that um, uh, that that you can identify? Uh, there are changes in Syria, uh, but I I'm not sure that they are uh, too connected with the Ukrainian uh, issue. Uh, let me emphasize uh, that basically we have zero interest in Syria to exclude the armed transfer that happens through Syria and the Iranian-based activities that we see in Syria. Uh, we've been operating against this for many years now. Uh, we have done so and we will continue to do so, and we don't see much difference uh, in terms of the Russian policy of what is being done there, etc. I'm happy to see a little bit more stability in Syria. It's the Assad regime, but still it's more stable than it used to be before. And I see some activities between Syria and the Arab League countries uh, and its neighbors uh, talks and meetings that were, were not held for, for, for a decade or so. And I think that eventually if Assad wants to be part of the region, of the close region, I would say, he will have to end up his relations, uh, negative relations with, uh, with Iran as far as military activities and terror activities in the area. But that's a trend uh, yet to be seen if it happens. I'm not sure that he's capable of doing so. We will have to follow that. Um, the other Ukraine question I want to ask you, uh, you referred to it earlier in your remarks, but I, Look, Israel has come in for some criticism. Um, some have accused Israel of not being sufficiently supportive of Ukraine um, uh, and of not sufficiently enforcing or not enforcing uh, joining in the sanctions on Russia. Um, uh, what's your response to this? I hear the criticism. Uh, I don't accept it. Uh... Uh, we have we are a small country with uh, uh, lots of uh, regional considerations that we need to take in advance uh, in consideration. We went with the West and the United States condemning the the Russian aggressiveness. Uh, we moved forward with hundreds of tons of humanitarian support. We have done so with medical support, and we will continue to seek whatever we can give to the Ukrainian people in the very, very hard times, the pictures and the reality uh, is very better. Uh, there's no uh, doubt about it. Uh, we are sharing an aerial border with Russia, uh, practically speaking, uh, over the skies of uh, Syria and uh, Lebanon. And I think that we are acting right. Um, let me ask a couple of good news questions, Benny. Um, you know, the there news been, always bring the good news at the very end of it. I know, but but you know, we, we there is some good news. Yeah. Uh, there's been a um, a flurry of progress in your relations with Arab states over the last eighteen months. It's it's uh, very difficult to keep up. Two landmark achievements were your own uh, trips to Morocco and Bahrain to sign security agreements. I mean, one has to pinch oneself to think that Israel actually has signed security agreements with uh, states in the Gulf and in North Africa. Um, what's the content? What's the significance? And then I'm going to ask you more about how we can turn, whether you're thinking of turning these bilateral agreements into regional opportunities for cooperation. Yeah, uh, indeed, uh, Rob, this, those are very good news. You know, uh, I told the story uh, when I was when I was in boot camp, the young paratrooper, I was called to secure 
Sadat convoy is on his way to Jerusalem back in 77, 78. And I've used the very same jet to fly to Bahrain uh, as the Minister of Defense some 42 years later. Uh, that shows you how good are Boeing's uh, jets, but uh, it's still flying. <laughs> uh, and, and it is very exciting. We should not take it for granted. You know, uh, we are communicating with our Egyptian friends, with Jordanians, with uh, Bahrainian, UAEs, Morocco. Uh, to some degrees, we have, we, st we hope it will move forward with Sudan and other countries uh, in the region as well as it, as it evolves. Uh, so those are indeed very good, uh, very good news. Uh, I hope it will continue from the level of diplomacy, uh, military, intelligence cooperation, operational cooperation, into the people-to-people -people aspect. I think there is good chance for that, uh, especially when you talk about the UAE and Bahrain and Morocco, which we have uh, good relations uh, and that we can benefit from it. Um, uh, last Tuesday, or two days ago, April 4, uh, we had an Air Force Commandant change. Uh, uh, General Barr replaced General Norkin. And in the ceremony, we had three languages simultaneously, Hebrew, English, and Arabic, because his counterparts from the area came to participate uh, in the change of command ceremony. We have moved into CENTCOM responsibility, which gives us the organizational framework to move forward with cooperation. So those are indeed uh, good trends. Uh, we will uh, strengthen them, uh, spend them as much as we can. Uh, and I think that while we see, I would say, a northern negative flank that goes from Iran to northern Iraq, Syria into Lebanon, we see a moderate camp south of it, based on Israel, Jordan, Saudi, the Gulf countries, Jordan, Egypt, of course. Uh, I hope we will have we will hear good news from Turkey as well. Uh, there is a little bit of uh, warm up uh, uh, activities uh, lately, um, and, uh, and and you're right. And you know, by the way, I don't know if you get to see the picture, but I have a picture of half full glass of wine here. Uh, and I always try to look at the half full flight part of it. I, I don't ignore the empty one, but uh, there, there are some good friends as well. <laughs> um, just on that, bef before we conclude, can you see um, a realistic potential for uh, regional efforts on issues such as missile defense or counter drone technology that are practical partnerships and uh, between you and these countries, not just bilateral relationships that you're building with individual countries? Yeah, I would say that without getting into details on this issue, I would definitely say it's a possibility. Okay. Look, um, uh, you've been very kind with your time, Benny. I know that uh, you have a lot of demands um, on you at the moment. Um, I want to thank you very much. Um, and I want to wish, uh, wish you a uh, happy Passover, and hopefully it's a peaceful and uneventful holiday um, uh, for for you and your family. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope so too, and I want to wish everybody uh, and anywhere basically uh, Ramadan, Pesach, and Eastern uh, holidays. I think uh, uh, that for us as political leaders uh, in Israel, but elsewhere as well, there's always the operational layer that we have to make sure is actually activated. But at the same time, we must try and uh, seek to shape the future 
into a better and more positive one. So this is what we are trying to do. Very good. Thank you very much, Minister of Defense, Benny Gantz. Thank you and very thank much. thank you for joining this special event at the Washington Institute. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.